Good morning and welcome back to the Grand Prairie and District Chamber of Commerce Community Pulse Series. My name is Cord Spiro and I'm the second vice chair for the chamber. We're meeting on Treaty 8 territory and we honor and acknowledge all the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people who have lived, traveled and gathered on these lands for thousands of years. As you've seen, this session is being recorded. You'll be able to ask questions in the chat box by using a raise hand function or unmuting. Uh, the Grand Prairie area has a robust and diverse economy. The Community Pulse Series is designed to provide updates and insights from a variety of industry sectors and organizations that make up the fabric of our unique and incredible community. Thank you to our presenting partners, Aquatary Utilities, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, City of Grand Prairie, Grand Prairie Regional Innovation Network, and our supporting partners, Community Futures Grand Prairie and Region County of Grand Prairie, Municipal District of Greenville. Uh, today we are highlighting presenting partner Aquaterra. Please welcome Chief Operating Officer Lord Brennan to speak on their behalf. Take it away, Laura. Thank you, Cord. It's very nice to be here today. I am uh, Laura Brennan, Chief Operating Officer for Aquaterra. I've been with Aquaterra for two years now, and I'm very uh, proud to work for such a um, community minded company. We have just a very quick little video here to highlight our involvement in Grand Prairie in the region. So if you'll bear with me, I'll get that up and running. I trust that we are provided with the best possible resources. I value that our community is cared for. My dad helps grow healthy communities. Trusted quality, valued service, peace of mind. Friends would walk up to me and just be like, what? Okay, I seem to have lost the button to unshare. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Back to you, Ford. Okay. Thank you, Laura, and thanks for Aquaterra for supporting our Community Pulse series. Um, this week's presenter is Kelly McTaggart, Community Engagement Advisor for the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Kelly leads CAPP's Western Canadian Outreach with focus on business communities, government, and regulators. Um, in addition to being a public spokesperson, she manages large-scale events for up to 500 people in various locations across Western Canada to build relationships with key stakeholders in progress CAPP's mandate, which is to enhance Canada's prosperity by enabling responsible growth of Canada's upstream oil and gas industry and advocating for economic competitiveness and safe environmentally and socially responsible performance. Please welcome Kelly McTaggart. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. That was a, a bit of a long introduction. I need to consolidate that. Um, so anyway, thanks for, for tuning in. I'm just gonna share my screen here. And hopefully everybody can see that. Perfect, I'm going to jump right into things. So. Uh, thanks again for having me. Um, 
I had a, a couple kind of general statements before I get started, but um, CAP is kind of in a transition mode right now. We just onboarded a new CEO. So Tim McMillan, who was with us for about seven years, um, has moved on and, and we're welcoming uh, Lisa Boyton um, as our first female CEO, uh, which is quite exciting. And she comes um, from uh, the, the CPP, so the, the Canadian Pension um organization and and she really comes with a focus on um reinvigorating focus on the investment community um internationally and within canada as well so um that's kind of where we're at right now um so a lot of our messaging and i'll, I'll keep it quite general today um we're kind of in a transition phase so if you have any questions about that please let me know but um, I think come September, she'll be um, starting to kind of, you know, present across Canada and, and um, you know, people will have kind of a better idea of where we're at uh, in terms of next steps and priorities as an industry and also as an industry association. So that being said, um, I will go through a state of the industry today. Uh, these are some of the, the priorities and things that I'll be focusing on. Uh, of course, a lot has changed in the last few months just because of the, the invasion of Ukraine and some of the inflationary pressures that we're seeing. Um, so I'll touch on some of that and, and kind of give you an idea of where pricing and the economics and some of our priorities fit into all of that. Okay, so it goes without saying that the past two years have been unprecedented in, in so many ways. Our industry has been faced with some of the biggest challenges we have ever seen. And from the COVID-19 pandemic to the current crisis in Ukraine, Canadian uh, oil and natural gas continues to have a critical role in providing responsibly produced energy to the world. And I always start with this slide uh, in kind of various forms, but this really shows the global energy mix um, to 2040. And, and we forecast it to 2040 because this uh, was the original projection within the Paris Climate Agreement. So that being said, if we were to meet our Paris Climate Agreement commitments, this is what the energy mix is currently forecasted to look like within those commitments. And it does change every year. So we update this infographic to reflect that. But um, I did want to point out that, you know, oil and natural gas are not going anywhere within that mix. The only area that we're really seeing a, a strong decline um, is coal and as well as biomass as well, really just because of a, a pricing perspective. But um, coal is, is coming down quite significantly um, because of replacement from natural gas and oil. Okay, so investment in industry. Uh, in January, we re released our annual capital forecast, uh, which showed an increase in spending in both the oil sands and the conventional sectors. So this was good news. Uh, and CAP is forecasting a 22% increase in natural gas and oil investment this year. Uh, capital spending in the sector is expected to grow by about $6 billion to reach a total of $32.8 billion compared to an estimated total investment of 269 in 2021. So overall, good news story, we are starting to see that increase. And I should mention that this isn't just kind of the first time that we're seeing, um, you know, a, a pretty positive increase in terms of capital spending. This is actually signifying um, a stable stabilization in the industry. So, um, you know, we've kind of been trying to climb out of the 2014-2015 lull, um, but you know, finally we're starting to kind of get to that plateau where we can start to rebuild. So from that perspective, I'm quite optimistic. I think a lot of the kind of geopolitical factors, um, you know, have increased pressures in this space as well in the last few months. But prior to that, um, you know, we were we were fairly optimistic about what we were seeing from an investment perspective. So that being said, um, Canada is continuing to lose market share to other jurisdictions. So um, we simply aren't seeing that investment at the pace that other jurisdictions are seeing it. So the good news is, is that we are seeing it, but the bad news is, is that we're not seeing it at a pace that we'd like to. Um, 
we are down 6% uh, in terms of market share in 2022. Uh, and this is a, a down from about 10% in 2014. And this 4% uh, percentage point drop represents over 21 billion in lost potential investment, a lot of that being in Alberta. That being said, uh, Alberta is expected to lead all provinces with upstream investment, and it's expected to increase about 24% uh, in 2022. So basically what that means is, is that the majority of the spending um, happening in Canada in both the conventional and unconventional sectors is happening here in Alberta, and much of which, much of which actually, um, you know, is happening in the midstream space, which is is very applicable to the Grand Prairie region. <clears throat> and I, I guess in dollars numbers, I should say that um, this twenty four percent increase is the equivalent of about five billion dollars um, into the province. And just a, a quick visual, I don't include this, um, this graph in all of my presentations, but I did just want to make a, a couple quick uh, comments on natural gas pricing because it is extremely uh, strong, uh, especially compared to the last five years. And we are seeing it continue to um, not only stabilize kind of in this higher price range, but also um, in terms of futures, we're, we're seeing some, some strong um, signs in that space. And I would say that, you know, just in terms of pricing and kind of um, the demands that we're seeing right now, our industry does have the best days ahead of it. I, I feel very confident in saying that. Um, and in fact, over the past year, our industry has, has rallied and we're approaching a future with cautious optimism. And I think these prices are a good support mechanism for that, for that optimism. And the International Energy Agency as well is showing a consistent increase in demand for oil and gas until 2050. So this is a, a really good visual. I included this just um, in terms of, of imports and kind of how the global energy um, systems are, are working right now in terms of imports um, from Russia. So, and also I'll circulate, I can circulate this deck as well. So you have the information. Um, but prior to issues escalating in Ukraine, uh, the International Energy Agency showed oil and natural gas supplies increasingly concentrated in a, a small number of low cost, low ESG producers. Um, so places that wouldn't necessarily be ideal from an ESG perspective to get our global energy from. And the October 2021 analysis estimated that Russia and OPEC would command over 60% uh, of the global oil and natural gas market by 2050. So you can imagine why we're in the position that we are now if, if we were well in our way to that 60% that number. And now basically, you know, the, the Western countries are trying to, to, to get off of um, Russia, particularly in terms of an energy source we're really um, scuppered in terms of, of secure energy, which is you know, exactly why we're seeing high, high prices across the board, not just at the pumps, but kind of in every aspect of our, of our everyday lives. So you know, offloading our emissions to countries like Russia was previously seen as a leg legitimate climate solution. And I say this because you know, high ESG, um, commitment countries like Canada really take the approach of not in my backyard. So, um, you know, we go elsewhere where ESG commitments are low and, and prices also are reflected um, by that as well. So reducing emissions became the priority uh, here at home, whereas, you know, reliability, affordability and security were reduced um, to supporting roles. And this is something that we've been talking about for quite a long time, you know, in terms of um, the, the pipeline discussion and really trying to get our product to market. A big um, underlying conversation for all of that was uh, energy security. So um, only in the, the last couple of months has that, I think, fully resonated with you know, with uh, members of the general public. 
So things have changed and the realities of energy security have never been more apparent uh, than in recent months. And it's really forcing a rethink on global energy policy. So Canada needs to position itself to take advantage of this significant um, opportunity. And from the Canadian perspective, polling continues to show that the state of our country's economy remains among the most important issues for Canada, so, or for Canadians. So, you know, the industry represents about 6% of uh, Canada's total GDP. Of course, we could see this increase and really have an opportunity to shrink that GDP to, to debt ratio which, you know, we need to create exports to reduce that, that gap. That's the only way that we can really do that. Um, in addition, um, you know, we really have an opportunity to be a supplier of choice. And so this is just kind of another summary of the economic contribution. And I really just added this from a, from a visual um, perspective, but you can see in terms of investment by sector um, in Canada, oil and gas um, leads. So I always like that just compared to some of our other, of our other large sectors in Canada. Okay, and another reason that kind of makes Canada unique and uh, you know going back to that kind of ESG commitment we've really seen a market change um, in terms of indigenous support for industry in the last decade so I just wanted to kind of highlight some stats that's, that that we've seen um, especially you know in the interest of reconciliation and some of the work that we're doing on that so the the oil and natural gas industry really champions the importance of reconciliation and considers the natural um, resource development to be integral to canadian reconciliation as a whole and our sector has made major strides in developing relationships based on trust and respect um, with communities and also learning from Indigenous knowledge and advancing reconciliation by identifying ways to share in the benefits, uh, particularly from an economic reconciliation perspective. So these are recent numbers, but we are seeing 65% of Indigenous people um, support or strongly support resource development in Canada. And these numbers are growing year over year. In terms of Indigenous priorities uh, in Canada, and this is fairly recent polling, um, resource development jobs continue to rank second behind healthcare. And I should say that this is very similar to um, the national polling that we see as a whole. Typically in Canada, we see healthcare as a number one, number two pr priority, whereas the economy, generally speaking, falls as number two. Um, so very, very um, kind of consistent there, but this gets a little bit more specific because it pertains to resource development jobs. Um, a couple stats here is, is that the oil and gas and mining sectors represent eight of the 10, eight of the top 10 highest paying occupations for Indigenous people in Canada. And according to Statistics Canada, Indigenous workers in the oil and gas sector earn over three times um, the average Canadian salary. In fact, oil and gas related occupations represent the top six highest paying occupations for Indigenous women in Canada, with pipeline transportation the highest. So shared economic opportunities are really only part of the industry's engagement. Uh, both industry and Indigenous peoples place high value on environmental stewardship, which brings me to my next point. Okay, so environmental leadership. There's a couple of things that industry is very focused on right now. Um, the, the need to include negative emissions tech, uh, such as carbon capture uh, use and storage. And in Alberta, we have a, a major, major opportunity of that just because of our, our rock foundations um, here in the province. And then, uh, you know, the opportunity to contribute our expertise and experience um, from emissions reductions technologies across sectors in Canada. So, you know, one major opportunity that we have is um, LNG, so liquefied natural gas in Canada. And 
Um, you know, in terms of a GHG perspective, Canada really has the best LNG in the world uh, in terms of, a, of an emissions perspective, also from a cost perspective as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about that when we, as we go. So clean tech innovation in the oil and gas sector will provide a critical path for job creation, environmental performance, investment, and overall advancement of our industry in Alberta and in Canada while um, reducing global emissions. So, you know, when I was saying previously how, you know, developed countries kind of take that approach of not in my backyard, um, we actually really have a, a strong opportunity um, to export and reduce um, GHG emissions, globally speaking. Currently in China, they have 200 coal plants under development. Um, and, you know, in Canada, we currently only have one LNG facility project uh, in development in Canada. So that's LNG Canada. So the scale at which, um, you know, these, these Asian countries need energy and are expanding is at is at a pace that's far outpacing um, our ability to get cleaner energy to market. Um, you know, our sector has really taken a leading role in developing innovative technologies, and we need to, to get it out there. Um, a couple of things that we've really um, put a lot of investment into is um, is carbon capture and innovation in that space, as well as um, taking early action in, in methane emissions reductions. So in Alberta, the AER uses Directive 60 and 15 to regulate methane emissions of natural gas and oil operations. And our environmental regulations have reduced methane emissions, resulting in reduced GHG emissions by more than 8 million tons. So very significant. In addition to that, we've seen equivalency agreements um, between the federal government and Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia, so the provincial governments, um, methane management approaches to serve reduce emissions by about 45% um, by 2025. And I, if I'm correct, we've actually already hit those, those targets across provinces. Um, and in addition to that as well, we've also made significant headway in closure and liability management. And that was really a result of, um, you know, fast closures um, following the downturn in 2015. Okay, so kind of to wrap up, I think I'll, I'll leave it at this slide just because I did uh, mention LNG. So, you know, Canada has the resources to supply energy to the world, but we really lack su sufficient infrastructure needed to move our products to offshore markets. So, you know, no, we can't really solve this global energy crisis tomorrow. I think where Canada's opportunity is, is, um, you know, basically getting what we can to the U.S. as the U.S. Um, ships LNG and, and some of their products where they have the infrastructure for it to European markets. Um, and for years, Canada has stalled um, and canceled projects that could have connected our, our resources to allies um, who are now in need. So, so big loss there. And I think that, you know, once again, reiterates the need for market access um, and some of these major pipeline projects that have been on the books. <clears throat> so, you know, on the topic of energy prices prior to the invasion of Ukraine, we've seen rapidly increasing energy costs and price volatility for months um, as global supplies just haven't kept pace with demand. And this is, you know, it's, we've had a really interesting couple of years because at the you know at the beginning of the pandemic we were in a position where we saw prices drop dramatically because um, global storage facilities were full and now we're kind of in you know the opposite situation right now um so these shortfalls shortfalls have really become even more apparent as travel transportation and other demand drivers revive um, in response to easing pandemic restrictions. 
So Europe re relies on Russia for about 40% of its natural gas, which really, you know, reiterates the need for, for liquid natural gas and some of these compressed, um, compressed opportunities to ship a lot in smaller, smaller volumes. And European leaders have no recourse when it comes to energy security. And Canada really, as I mentioned, isn't in a position to assist because we lacked a vision um, about our role um, to play in climate and energy security in the first place. So that being said, you know, energy security issues, as we can see right now, really disrupt global economies. And it's time to, to address some of these irrational uh, energy policies here at home. And I think this all really puts it into perspective. Uh, that being said, I will turn it over to anybody if there's questions. And if I, I can't answer, I'm always happy to follow up. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so if you guys have any questions, you can uh, use the chat box or uh, use the raise hand function and we'll uh, take them as they come. I have a question for you, Kelly, while we get started here. Why do you think previous messaging hasn't worked up until the Russia-Ukraine crisis here? Um, it seems like the conversation really hasn't landed. Yeah, and in terms of... Um especially market access in some of those conversations. I think it really comes down to climate commitments that our federal government um, has made. They've, they've really been um, you know, very ambitious and I think their line of sight to get there hasn't um, included consideration on some of these other topics. I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, I don't think that any of us would have really predicted necessarily that we would be in the position that we're in right now. Um, so I think that's kind of the big, the big thing is, is that sometimes people just don't like to see what's right in front of them. And, and, you know, our governments have really had tunnel vision, um, in that regard. I, I will say there has been a major change in, in the public dialogue around energy and access to energy, and people are finally starting to connect the dots, um, you know, and it's interesting, but things as simple as, you know, seeing heightened gas prices at the tank and really having that um, affect your day to day life is, um, you know, you kind of have to have that personal uh, attachment or personal outcome um, to connect some of these dots. I, I, I think one opportunity that we can really bring energy back to as well is, is food prices in Canada right now, you know, we're seeing prices um, at an increase of 20 to 25 percent, um, which is kind of the highest inflationary rate we've we've seen um, in such a short period, um, basically ever. Um, so, you know, there's a there's a lot of education that needs to happen around um, the, those sorts of things as well. But I, I think it's starting to resonate. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, you mentioned the carbon capture. Um, and I know with the Greenview Industrial Gateway, they've been talking about the carbon capture hub. Can you talk a little bit more about carbon capture? Because it's all quite like, it's quite mysterious still um, from not being directly in the industry, so. Yeah, I actually included this slide just because we have been getting a lot of um, questions about that. So hopefully, you can you still see my screen? No, we stopped the share so that we could maybe get some more faces on the screen. Everyone's being so shy today. No one has their camera um, on. It's, it is disabled for me now to share my screen, but if, if I'm able to share my screen, I can share, um, I can share a good slide. Here we go. Um, yeah, so hopefully you can see this now. Yep, that popped up. Yeah, so... Carbon capture, in, in my opinion, is going to be one of those things where we look back in, in 30 years and it's just going to be a common practice in, in the sector in Canada. And I think, you know, the common kind of um, sentiment will be, well, why, why weren't we always doing that? Um, so really, it's, it's a viable technology to mitigate carbon emissions. So, um, you know, CO2 that's, that's um, produced in any sort of manufacturing 
uh, or industrial process. It doesn't just have to be natural, you know, oil and natural gas um, is captured at a power plant. And then it's basically put deep, deep into ground um, in storage. So when you see CCUS, the S, you know, um, stands for storage in this case. And Alberta has a really unique opportunity here because of our kind of geological foundation, especially in southern Alberta. We have really deep basins that have producing that have been producing um, oil and natural gas for a very long time. And so they're very deep and there's a lot of storage opportunity. Um, so that being said, it, you know, it captures the, the CO2 so that it's not being emitted into the atmosphere. But then there's also a lot of opportunity for utilization. So you can actually, um, you know, take this CO2 that's been captured um, and then, you know, convert it through um, through uh, chemical processes to create other products. Mm -hmm. In Canada right now, I would say that the most, um, uh, kind of the most, I shouldn't say the most research, but a lot of innovation is being put into um, creating concrete. That's one area that we're seeing a lot of um, investment and a lot of really interesting technology be developed, um, which is great because with, you know, we're, I'll use an example, but we're currently in a housing crisis in Canada. Um, from an infrastructure, you know, point of view, we need a lot of concrete, and so there's a real opportunity here to kind of have that full value chain. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's kind of the the basic um, overview of CCUS. So hopefully that that helps. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions out there? Um, have one for you. So if, if Alberta, Canada is losing market share, who are we losing it to? Who's gaining market share? So our number one competitor is also our number one customer, which is the United States. Um, we actually saw a huge easing of restrictions in the Obama era. era. So in 2008, we saw um, a renewed interest. And I, I think actually it was from a security perspective that they were, they really eased um, a lot of development requirements in the States. And so that's where we really saw the industry take off and have renewed investment in the States was in 2008. Um, I think a lot of people think it's just happened in the last um, few years, but it's actually been, you know, over a decade that we've been in this state of competition. Um, and so, yeah, you know, for one interesting stat is I think, you know, I mentioned in my, my presentation that we really only have one LNG project in development right now. Um, but in the States in the past 10 years, they've been able to, um, either fully build or still in development, um, you know, close to hundred LNG projects. Um, and they've been exporting LNG, um, for quite a few years now. So, our will to kind of get things done and, and the regulatory and policy hurdles that we have in Canada are um, not just a conversation piece. They're very, very real. And we're seeing that in terms of, um, you know, our ability to get things to market. Larry, you have a question? Yes, thanks, Gordon. Uh, and thanks, Kelly, for joining us this morning. Great presentation. Uh, I just want to circle back to the carbon capture and storage and utilization. Uh, of course, with that technology, uh, perceivably, our, our prices might be a little higher than uh, our competitors out there. Uh, is that a stumbling block or, or do you think that our buyers would overlook that because of the uh, environmental uh, ESG uh, uh, attributes of, uh, of carbon capture? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, so right now, I think there, our customers would be overlooking the price component a bit just because of the energy security perspective. And also, so our, our natural gas for one um, is quite a bit cheaper, like Asia, compared to Asia and, and Europe, you know, we still have some of the most affordable natural gas in the world. And so CCUS and, you know, we could talk about hydrogen as well as kind of a, an emerging fuel, but 
they don't just come from nothing. You have to have um, oil and natural gas development to kind of get to point B. Um, so I think where we're going to see um, the industry really take off is through government incentives and um, subsidies around the development. And we are starting to see that. Um, and it's it's really going to come from the provincial level. That's where we're seeing some of these major, like bigger announcements being made. Is is that um, in terms of you know provinces hitting certain targets? Um, yeah, the in terms of kind of royalty structure and um, yeah incentivization. That's really where we're seeing it. Um, the other thing I would say. I think I forgot the first part of your question, but just as a side note, is we are seeing a ton of private investment in um, in CCUS incubator technology. So, for example, there were some some uh, stats that just came out this week that U of C is actually creating more startups than. Um, universities like U of T or the University of Toronto or the University of Waterloo that have really led in that tech startup um, space for a couple decades. And now we're seeing, you know, a relatively small in comparison university actually exceeding that. And it, most of that technology is happening in um, energy technology to support hydrogen and CCUS. Well, great. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I agree that the the, uh, the subsidies, the innovation, the, the, the research that's going into it's going to make us world leaders here in the next, uh, you know, three to five years. So thanks for that. Okay, we have a we 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 have a question in the chat room here. Um, you touched on the industry careers and in health care at the top, uh, then oil and gas. Can you talk about the industry and if companies are taught? taking steps to train green entry level future team members? Yeah, so good question. Um, I wish I had some of the updated job da data I don't um, on me. So we typically go to Petra LMI, which is um, kind of the industry leader for, for job stats and that sort of thing. One thing that I would say is we are seeing an increased, um, we're seeing increased um, hiring in the, in the sector. And a lot of that from a, you know, a contingency and legacy planning is happening in the entry level spaces. So there has been a renewed focus on apprenticeships, on um, you know, EIT positions, so engineering and training positions, um, and, and some of those things, just because we are seeing such an influx in capital that um, we don't have enough people, um, you know, working in the industry right now to support the, the influx of capital that we're seeing. Uh, and this is really a result of, you know, massive layoffs and restructuring and, um, and that type of thing following 2015. So, that's a very high level answer, but we are definitely seeing um, an influx of, of this sort of thing. And um, a, lot of, a lot of roles are coming up in, in new energy development. So hydrogen, um, CCUS, but also in the power space. Um, so, you know, how do we generate and store um, power sus sustainably and effectively in Alberta? Um, you know, our grid is pretty much at capacity um, here in the province. So there's a, a lot of interest in, in those types of positions as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully that, that helps answer your question a bit. Yeah, that was great. That was great. Thanks, Kelly. I have a question that got sent to me. Um, you've mentioned hydrogen just briefly a couple of times. So how does hydrogen development and the technology fit into the future of our energy, especially in here in Alberta? Um, most definitely, I think I might just share my screen again. This is just some visual information for people. So hopefully, um, hold on. I think it's always better sometimes to have a visual, so. Okay, so um, a couple comments about hydrogen. So, you know, we don't have a major hydrogen um, economy in Canada. This is very new. So, you know, the approach that 
or the perspective that, you know, hydrogen is going to come in and save the day. And, and this is kind of the future of energy. We're, we're really seeing that rhetoric um, in places like Ontario and, and BC. We're really not there yet. Um, it's it's definitely going to be part of the energy solution, but it's um, it's going to be quite a while until we get there. So Hydrogen is a is a very energy dense fuel and it's derived from natural and gas from natural gas. And this is important because, you know, I already mentioned this, but you don't just produce hydrogen. It's it's um, an off product from another fuel source. So you have to develop natural gas in order to um, to get hydrogen. And in Alberta, our most common form of hydrogen is, is blue hydrogen. And that is because it is derived from natural gas. Um, so basically, you know, from a high level, natural gas is um, mixed with hot steam. Um, and then in the presence of a catalyst, so another element, uh, a chemical reaction occurs and creates hydrogen. But there's a few challenges with hydrogen because you need to have storage for hydrogen, which is one of the, you know, one of the benefits of CCUS because you can store hydrogen underground. But you also need to be able to transport um, hydrogen through means of, of pipelines is the main form. And we don't have that infrastructure um, at a mass scale currently um, in Alberta, so or in Canada, I should say. So um, there would be need to be a lot of, uh, of, you know, a lot of infrastructure developed from that perspective. Um, and then in addition to that, here's just a few kind of quick facts on it, but, um, you know, blue hydrogen is most definitely the most economical way to produce, um, to produce hydrogen. And that's because natural gas is so affordable in Canada. And so it's a great off product. Um, and there's a real opportunity here because our natural gas is abundant. As I mentioned, it's inexpensive um, and it's much more energy dense than lithium batteries. So as we kind of move into the, the I'll call it the Tesla era, um, you know, when we're producing, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, green tech and kind of battery driven low emission technology, um, hydrogen actually produce, you know, represents a great opportunity for energy density um, without having to mine for some of these rare minerals. Um, but that being said, I mean, as, as an emerging industry, there's still a lot of challenges to it. So um, it stores less energy than natural gas. Um, so not as efficient as natural gas. And it's, um, and Currently, it's quite costly because we haven't scaled the technology yet. Hopefully, that helps. Larry, do you have another question? Your hand's up. I do. Yes. Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Cord. Uh, Kelly, I don't know if this fits into the, the, the space of camp or not, but there is a lot of uh, activity and and uh, articles lately around uh, helium development in uh, Saskatchewan and Southern Alberta. Uh, is that something you follow? And is that something that uh, we might see as an emerging uh, industry here in the province? Yeah, I'm not. So I'm not super well versed in helium. We are seeing increased development, most definitely in Western Canada. And, and yeah, you, you mentioned Saskatchewan. I mean, Royal Helium is, I think, the major player in, in Western Canada. Um, there has been a global shortage of helium for quite a few years, um, and it's very important, um, especially in the medical space. So um, it's not it's not really, um, a, you know, a chemical that can be replicated or, or manufactured from other products that we have in Canada. So from some of these essential needs perspectives, you know, helium being one of them, this really came to light during the pandemic. I think there has been a renewed interest um, in helium in Western Canada. And a lot of the technology is the same as natural gas. And so we have the expertise in Canada to really diversify and kind of build other areas of, um, you know, gaseous economies. So that's kind of the extent of, I guess, what I can say about that. But um, definitely the conversation has been renewed in the, in the, the past few years. I, I've noticed that.
Any other questions out there? Kelly, I'm wondering, so the, um, you know, with the change of narrative over what's been happening the past couple of months, has that caught up, I guess, across the country with maybe starting up some of the projects that were previously denied? Has that conversation kind of caught up yet? And the work between provinces, or is that still kind of lagging? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, there, there has been some renewed conversations, but I wouldn't say it's been in the major pipeline space. So we get a lot of questions about Keystone XL. Um, you know, TC has, has publicly said there will not be um, a renewal of investment in that project. I think um, the, the loss on that is just too great to bring it to fruition. And I don't think that we would get, ever get the US um, under its current administration to kind of get there again. Um, where we're seeing a, a renewed interest is projects that had um, financial interest or support from uh, members of the EU. So a couple examples of that would be, you know, smaller, I shouldn't say small scale, but smaller scale LNG projects on the East Coast. Um, so companies um, that, you know, operate in Southern Alberta, who um, produce or have been producing natural gas for a long time, um, have identified shipping routes through the US and back up through the Eastern Seaboard to Nova Scotia. Um, and LNG facilities are in discussions now with the federal government um, on the East Coast. And, and some of these projects were put to rest, you know, in the last couple of years. And um we're hearing about them now and final investment decisions are expected to be made in the in the next couple of weeks in some cases so um from that perspective most definitely i think um the federal government was a bit shy on committing to lng but um we're in a position now where um it's it's the cleanest and um i think they're willing to kind of um, take a bit of a, a leap of faith um, from some of the um, opposition that they'll face from industry opponents. Another project that we saw, saw move forward was Beta Nord. So um, Equinor, which, um, you know, is, is a Norwegian co company, they uh, recently got approval of an offshore oil um, project in Newfoundland. And that decision was made about a month after the invasion of Ukraine. And these, this is not a coincidence. I think some of um, these decisions are made with that pressure in mind. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess uh, if there's no more questions out there, we can uh, probably wrap up and give you guys 10 more minutes back in your day. Um, last call, anybody? No, okay. Well, thanks, ag thanks again to uh, to Kelly, to Laura, to our presenting partners, Aquaterra, CAPP, City of Grand Prairie, GP Rin, to our supporting partners, Community Futures, Grand Prairie and Region, County of Grand Prairie, MD of Greenview, and all of our participants. Uh, the next installment of our Community Pulse series will be on June 8th. Uh, featuring partner will be is to be determined uh also upcoming is a ribbon cutting uh cmb broker tomorrow at 2 p.m as well as the business after five mixer hosted by the art gallery of grand prairie uh contact the chamber for more information or visit our website grandprairiechamber.com uh have a great rest of your day guys thanks for sh showing up